All right, we're doing chapter nine, finishing it off, and then after that, I'll be doing, you know, mid final final review until we kind of go into it. Um, oh, look, now it's back. Okay, so let's let's go over the um, the whole test statistic thing. Let's see. Oh, what's this one? Okay. I don't know if you should you should have something like this. Does everybody have it? This might be good. I could make a copy, but if you have it, um, you can use it for the test. Um, so let's go on. So all the charts? Uh, no, there's an F chart. It's not all the statistics, but it's most of it. You mean for the final? Yeah. Yeah, it'll be sufficient. Yeah. Uh, the one, well, the one you need, I don't know if it's here, is a chi-square. Yeah, it's here. Chi-square is here. Student T and the normal. The binomial is not here, but hopefully we can use the normal or the T. Uh, so let's do a real quick review on that first. Okay. So that we're doing all about hypothesis testing. And then what we had... We have really this the whole hypothesis testing setup, which is really the heart of statistics and probability. Okay, hypothesis testing, and then you have two broad broad categories where you're going to have, you know, that you'd have just a, a a single column of of data, right? That you're asking some type of hy null hypothesis. Let's say. Yeah, yeah. Well, let me let me take that back here for a second. So we have single data, and then we have like uh, we have paired data, or or what we have we can we can have like two samples. So we either have one sample or two samples. Let me get that better. Okay, so we have the two samples. Basically, this is chapter nine. Well, we're going to do hypothesis testing. This is on chapter nine. Okay, and this is two sample hypothesis, uh, hypothesis testing. Okay, and the other one is this, that we just got the one sample. Okay, so that's basically, uh, and this is going to be chapter eight. All right, so one and two sample now, and the one sample, and so far as the test is concerned, we can have, uh, we have a p-value test. Yeah, we can. We also have a uh, a test statistic. Remember, and we have as another th something to look at is the confidence interval. That was the confidence interval. Okay, so on the one sample test, the different categories we're going to have. Actually, we have one that was a binomial. This is a kind of, uh, 
distribution called a binomial, and this requires P equals some kind of success, and then you have Q, okay, which is 1 minus P. Because that's a binomial, so when we did that binomial, it looked, the distribution looks like something like this, where we had N and we had X, and then we had P raised to the N minus X, that's the probability of success, and this is times the number of failures, which is just uh, uh, X. Okay? This is a distribution. It is a binomial distribution. It's, it's, it is discrete. Now, if we have like some, some kind of uh, situation where n is um, greater than or equal to 30 on a sample size, or if we have n p or n q, these are greater than or equal to 5, then at this time we can use the normal or the t, depending whether you have information on the standard deviation. If you have the population deviation, if they give it to you, then this is really nice. So I'm going to put here that, that sigma is known. Okay? And then if it's not, we can do what's called the T distribution. Well, T, T uh, student S, student T, well, they call it the student T. distribution, okay? And that one you need to have your degree of freedoms, which is n minus 1, okay? That's the student, this is a t, by the way. Okay. This is m more or less when, you know, you're going to use s instead from your sample. You know, use s, that's a sample deviation. You use that instead of sigma, of course. All right. Now, um, we have one other just that's completely different, and this is chi-square. Okay, and this chi-square, chi we're talking about a null hypothesis with regard to the s true sigma. So, if we say it's something, let's say, for example, uh, whatever, we say it's you know, it's one, then the, the alternative could be something like, you know, it's not one, for example. But when you do this hypothesis testing, you would have to do it based on the table that says chi-square. Anybody, everybody okay with that? Okay, now, the test statistic for this guy here is all in all of this, this garbage here. So first we have the test statistic, and um, so uh, we have one other here that we hadn't talked about now. Basically, P can be considered a proportion. I'm not talking about, well, I mean, the probability of success could be a proportion, a percentage, right? So we have the other thing that we call it the, uh, we have in within the category of one, okay, it's still category one, we also have the, uh, you know, the idea of proportion, which you can consider probability of success and failure a proportion of the total amount of people that's in the sample. Certain amount of them failed, certain amount of them passed, right? But in general, when you're testing near, you're testing the null, uh, and I'm making this P a little bit different looking, so that you know that this P is for proportion. So the proportion here, we can say is equal to whatever you want, 0.5, for example, and an alternative for the proportion is, let's say, less than 0.5, which would be a one tail to the left. And um, accordingly, we could use either the normal or the T distribution. Now, when we talk about the test statistic for um, the normal, the test statistic, this is where to see where it hits on the accept or the reject region of the distribution, right? 
And remember our z-test here. I'm going to put a little t there. It's going to be, um, well, x. This is what we got from our sample, right? The average minus what we hypothesize that mu is. Because in this guy, the normal distribution, right? The null hypothesis is going to look like something when you're talking about the mean is going to be equal, let's say, I don't know, to zero. And, you know, you can have an alternative, anything you want. Uh, so not equal to zero, let's say. Okay. When you, this is a, the null. The null is going to have this test statistic. Okay. So this is what's going to do, what you're going to decide whether you accept or reject. In other words, the bell curve will look like this. Right, and you're going to have alpha in the tails, and you're going to have these critical values. Yes, and the critical values you see where Z of T hits. If it hits in here, you fail to reject the null hypothesis, which means that you're accepting an essence. <laughs> you're not proving it's that, it just says it appears that the evidence you cannot reject a null hypothesis, which in this case is saying that mu is equal to zero. Okay, now for your test statistic on the proportion, that would have been this proportion. If you're using the actual, um, well, if you're going to use, uh, if it's if you can use the the normal curve, right? Then it's very similar to that. Look at what the diff for my so for my z test when I'm talking about a proportion. That's going to be equal to, uh, well, what do I have? I have my p hat, right? That's that, that weird p. Pure hat minus the weird, what we think it is. That's r like rho. That's a p hat. <laughs> okay, and then we divide by, it's a lot like, uh, well, I didn't finish here. And this would be divided by s, see? Um, this one, s divided by the square root of n. Okay. Now, for the test statistic fails here, we have p hat. Now, you may not remember, but p times q is the deviation like this. It's the variance. And then that thing's going to divide by n. Okay? Test statistic. Then we have a test statistic uh, for the t distribution, the test statistic to see where that hits. That's going to be a lot like the Z, right? So the t-test. The t-test statistic is going to be equal to, again, x minus mu, uh, yeah, over sigma, uh, sorry, over s divided by square root of n. Okay, and z is a sigma. Okay, now this is this is different. Hold on, I made a mistake here. Uh, right here, um, here. Okay, so this is when. Notice that what I'm going to put here, I'm putting a this in the sigma. I'm going here. I put it. Okay, so this is sigma because in this case you happen and they give you this that you know sigma is known, isn't it? Known. You see the word known. And this one, sigma is unknown, so we're using from our sample. That's where we get this S. Are we okay with that? Yeah, and uh, that's the, so we got the T. Now, what about the chi squared distribution? The, the test for the chi test is going to be equal to, it's going to be equal to, the, we call this the chi test chi test is going to be n minus 1 times uh, s squared divided by the sigma squared. Now, that would be this. Look, s is what we got from our sample, true? n minus 1 is our sample size minus 1, but sigma squared is what we're testing. Everything here had to do with the mean or the proportion. Proportion, the mean, the mean, and now we're talking about the distribution of the variance. Okay? 
So then in uh, chapter 9, we're going to have like two types of uh, distribution. These distributions are going to be for um, pooled and not pooled. So this is on chapter 9. <laughs> okay, uh, I don't have enough room. But uh, keep in mind that when you have, when you pick, select which distribution you're going to use, that when they give you a confidence interval, all right, so that 1 minus the confidence interval is going to be equal to alpha. Alpha is what's going to go in here. Alpha is in the guts. And if it's a two-tailed test, you're going to have to take alpha and divide it by 2. What makes it a two-tailed test is when I say that this is not equal to 0. Then it's a two-tailed test, OK? So how would we find this number here and this number here? Well, depending on if it's a, you know, which one of these is. But if you're calling it normal, you're going to look like, you know, if this is 0 0.05 here and 0 0.05 or something like this, you'll find that it's like 1.96 minus 1.96 thereabouts. So now I take my test statistic and I, I see where it hits. Test. Okay, and this is a fail. If it lands there, it fails to reject, which means you're accepting them. I mean, evidence seems that it can be. And if it falls, if this falls in here or here, right? Um, sorry, this is accept. <laughs> Or you fail to reject, which is the same as an accept, OK? So this is accept zone. But this is a failure to reject. But this is a reject. And if it's sitting here, it's a reject. OK, any questions? I know it's a, it looks like a lot, but it's not too bad. You just have to look at the table and see which test you need for which which hypothesis testing you're doing. <coughs> okay. Now. Okay, now we got the whole thing. We're going into chapter 9. We're going to kind of revisit this, but now with two samples. So everything in chapter 9 is two sample. This is one sample. Two sample. So I'll give you an idea of the test, uh, you know, the test statistics that go along with each uh, distribution. And it's a little more complicated for the, uh, and we have the same situation of sigma known and not known. Okay, so let me clear that. Any questions on this? Is it too easy? Okay. All right, so let's go here. Now, with regard to two sample, with regard to the two sample, first we have to look at the two, uh, we got two called two samples. We have two samples, <laughs> by definition, <laughs> at least, okay? So in that case, the first thing we have to determine if, if each, let's call the data a column. So this is column one and column two, and these have data points. And this has, so one would ask, um, is it, is if these two columns are dependent in some way, or are they independent? We'll go over this again, right? Once that's determined, now it's not so easy to determine maybe, for example, you could have a husband and wife. We would consider that dependent because they're paired out, you know, to each other. Whereas independence could be something that has nothing to do with one column affects the other at all. Okay, depending on which one of this is depending what kind of test you got to run. Now. The next thing you have to going to have to look at is again is sigma known? Is it is it known? Okay, well it's yes or no. And then the other thing is if it's no, if it's not known, you know, then we're asking the same idea. Are they paired in some way? Are they matched pair? Like before and after? It's the same guy, before and after. This looks like a before and after. 
Okay, and of course we have, you know, where we're going to be using S and something called the pooled variance. For two samples who sigmas, oops, where sigma of one sample is very close to the sigma of the second or the same. If this means approximately, if they're approximately the same, you're going to have to use this what we call pooled variance. So let's start. And then the test statistic. So now we're going to do the, we're talking about the proportion of two samples, right? And now we have, if we, if we, if they tell us that the proportion is drawn, okay, it could be binomial, but if it's big enough, we're well, probably not. And I don't think I'm using the binomial table anywhere, and it's not on here. Well, it's there. But we'll be able to use the normal or the T student distribution as an approximation to the normal given certain circumstances. But if it's, if they tell us off the bat, then we know that we've tested these. We did the QQ quartile thing and we did a histogram and we see that ah, looks kind of bell-like. So this is the Z test now. Now what do you think we're going to do? Well, the first thing you want to know is the difference between, you know, in this case they're putting uh, P hat 1, yes, P minus, <laughs> minus, P hat 2, okay? So that's the differ difference in the proportion of the two samples, yeah? And now we have, and then we have what our, th our, our hypothesize. What always is going to go here? Like, if we have a null hypothesis, right, where we can say, well, this, is, this is our null, we would say something, for example, that P, no, the true P, see that? The true proportion, that kind of P is kind of weird. Uh, P1 is not equal to P2, the proportion. Now, these are theorized. We're theorizing what we think God's proportions are. We're saying that we believe, oh, sorry. Well, always on the one, that we're all, on the one where you're doing the, hypo, the null, this will always be equal. Always equal. So this is equal, and the alternative will, will depend whether you want a two-tail or one-tail, depending on how you're setting it up. Basically, you'd see row and row, or I call it row, one, two, and it, this would be not, okay? Indicating a two-tail test. Okay, now, so, so what we're going to test, notice that this is the man-made calculation, yes? So this must be the godlike combination, right? Where I'm putting what? Row 1 minus row 2. But what we think are the actual values that come from here. This is our hypothesized. We think that this is what God's difference is. This is our sampled hats. You see? If you look at that, it, it should look a lot like this when we had a z-test statistic with one sample and, and we had p-hat. Let's see if we had a p-hat, right? And we automatically subtract it when we think it's the true p. Remember, there's only one. So I could call this one and one. But you see, again, we're testing the man-made minus what we think God's truth is. Rho, are you with me? Right here, we're taking our mind men difference because we have two samples. Here, we only have one. So our test statistic was, given that we know what sigma, divided by the square root of n. Okay, that was our test statistic for proportion. If by chance we don't need, we don't have sigma, guess what we do? We take our s and replace that sigma. And then, usually call this a t-test, a student test which would still be p hat minus rho 1 and then divided by s divided by the square root. This is the test statistic. I want you to be able to see the difference between one sample and two. When we're talking about two samples, what do we have to compare? Their differences. So 
So if this difference, seeing how much different it is from their theorized difference, and remember, you can't have a test statistics without including variance or deviation. You can't do it just based on, on, on these samples here. So then we have to do what's called our, our two proportion. So now, now what we do is a square root, which looks kind of like this, you know, for one, but we have two. So we're going to have something, this thing, we're going to go two proportion. And we're going to have here, we're going to have instead of, um, yeah, okay, for the Z guy, we're going to have P bar Q bar. And uh, it looks a little different. So and then here we have N1. That's the sample size of the first column. And then we have P bar Q bar over N2. Okay. Now, what is this P bar Q bar business? And the reason we have it at all is because we're pooling our variance. They're two different variances. So uh, we're going to have that P bar is equal to uh, x1 plus x2. That's a 2. x1 over x2 divided by n1 plus n2. Of course, what's q bar? Anybody care to guess? Q is going to be minus P bar. Just like it was before, but with P hat. Okay, so in this case, you're testing two proportions. Okay? And you're going to have to pull in this amount here. Um, okay, and now, do you remember we have the one for T? Right, so we would expect a T test for two proportions. And what would that be? Let me see. Okay. What would that be? So, in the same idea, that's a Z, and then and this one's a T test, okay? So you would expect a T test to look a lot like, uh, okay, but now, we're not talking about proportion. Suppose we talk about the null hypothesis of two different means where we think God's truth is this and that it's equal to the next God's truth, not next, but God's truth of the second column. And that means the two averages are the same or there's been no change in the mean, right? Where this can be any way you want it. Remember, this guy's always equal on top. So this would make a two-tailed test, testing, right? But this guy is a real similar, but now we have this thing called it a t-test. See? A t-test. That's going to be equal. Well, what were the first thing? I mean, what's the man-made statistic that we use to forecast mu? This one, obviously, we had p-hat to forecast. We're forecasting this. But we use our data for that. So what do you expect this to be? Not p-hat, but what? I'm talking about what do I use to estimate the mean for from the man side? X bar. X bar. So I would expect this to be X bar from the first minus X bar from the second. Minus what we theorize it is, it's mu, yeah, mu 1 minus mu 2. Yes? Now, look what our hypothesis, what we're, what, what we're going to actually plug in here. If we say that this is equal to this, yes? Isn't that really saying that mu1 minus mu2 is equal to 0? Because I could add a negative here and bring it over here. So really what this equals here is I'm testing this thing equals to 0. And they, you know, if I'm saying they're equal to each other in any of them, I'm always going to be putting 0 in here when I test it, right? Because I'm saying that I think it's the same. So their difference must be zero, okay? So then I have to divide by either a pooled, whether you know, in this case, whether you know sigma or not, you use S or not, whether it's pooled or not. So in this one now, 
I have. Notice there's no sigmas now. I have s pooled. We call it s pooled squared plus s pooled squared divided by n1 divided by n2. Okay? It's the same idea. This p and q bar is replaced with whatever. This is x1 divided by n1 over 2. Okay, so that's my test statistic when we're talking about the mean. This is our test statistics when we're talking about a proportion with two samples. Okay, now, in this case, we have to have, when we use the t, okay, one of the things that we need to have is that the two, that we have independence, independent that we were talking about earlier. All right, the two columns need to be independent. The two columns, the, whatever, the two columns of data have to be independent, right? Two is um, sigma one, sorry, sigma one and sigma two, they are unknown. Anytime you have more doubt, more unknown, you're going to be using a T. Okay, when you know more about what's happening and you know it's normal, then you use a normal distribution. Okay, so that's what it is when we have, now this guy up here, so that was, uh, and, uh, and then they're also, not only are they un unknown, but they're going to be assumed to be, to be, unequal. Okay? That's when we're using this pool stuff. When, when they're unequal. Okay? And then, uh, so we have a Z when, of course, when sigma is known, right? We're just replacing this with not this one, but when sigma is known, well, we'll do that now. Okay, so we have a t test statistic when the two columns are independent and when these sigma one is unknown, and they're not only assumed, they're not close. Because if they're close, yeah, then we have to use this spooled value. And uh, let's go over here. Um, so, now, now if we have data that's matched and paired, this one we don't care whether the columns are, they're not, they're independent. One doesn't affect the other, right? Okay, so let's clear that off. Uh, okay, so if we have a situation where we have a matched pair, Two, and they're matched. Okay, if they're matched, then we use a test statistic like this, a T test statistic, and that equals two. Well, what we have here is, uh, again, X bar from the one minus X bar from the second, right? And then over here we have, oops, sorry, I made a mistake. Mm. Let, me, let me scratch that. Okay, for when it matched, then you're going to have what's called d bar, d bar minus what we th think the average of the d is divided by s of d divided by square root of n. Now, what is this d bar business? Well, if they're matched, so you have one column one and column two, right? So whatever that figure is. And, and this figure, let's say, is, right? Every one of these is going to be whatever they are. You know, they're just different values, right? And on and on and on. But they've been matched. This, this is the first guy, second guy, third guy. They're matched. So you're going to connect a new column. The difference is going to be the difference of this, 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 this. 
So this is going to be d1, d2, down to your d sub nth difference. That's the difference of the two columns. This difference has a distribution. What have you done here? You've taken a two sample, yes? And now we're looking at one column only, which is like a single sample. Because we're looking at the difference. So in that case, we have a test statistic of d bar. Well, what's d bar? It's the average. d bar is equal to the summation of all di over uh, n. And then this i goes from 1 to n. That's your average. Just add them up and divide by n. Divide what? Your differences. Add up your differences. Yeah? And that goes back to like a single you know, single sample, yes? So there's your D bar. There's your mu bar. That's what your hypothesis is on. Now notice that when you're hypothesizing with a matched or paired thing, then you're actually saying my null hypothesis in this case is that is that the mean difference is equal to something. If you say it's equal to zero, you're basically saying there is no difference. Right, because the average, and then your alternative can be either a one test, one tail, or two ta tail. So if you see what we've done here, we've converted it into a single single column, and this one may be not equal to zero, which would be a two tail test. It's easier in a way, uh, but they have to be matched up, and then you're just working with one column of data. Okay. Are we okay with that? Uh, okay, if we're okay with that, then uh, let's try some, some problems here. So let's go uh, here. Uh -huh. What's going on? Okay. Uh, well, let's go through this one. Is that so? Um, Let's see. So we're going to make a claim about two proportions. How is a proportion different than a mean? When, I, when I'm testing for mu, I'm testing for God's truth, right? But when I'm testing for a proportion, it's not God's truth. I mean, mu is not mu anymore, right? What is it? What I'm trying to say is that, what, what is a proportion? Yeah, it's a percentage. So where we're talking about mu is more about an average. But when you're asking what percentage of population are, come, are born midgets, that's a proportion. You can't use mu anymore. You have to use p or p hat. OK? So I, mean, let's, I haven't gone over the confidence interval yet, so let's go. Go back next. Okay. So uh, let me make sure I got that. Uh, make sure we get that right. Uh, okay. All right. So 9.1, two proportions. Look what p hat is. It's how many x ones. X one is how many are midgets <laughs> divided by the total population? Do you see it? Okay. So, the, we'll be testing claims about two proportions. And, well, we'll construct an interval, too. An inter um, okay, the difference between the two proportion, population proportions. You're always theorizing about the population. Your null hypothesis will have only, not your p hats, not your x bars, they'll have only your population parameters. Okay? All right. So we can use that for probabilities or decimal, whatever, it's all good. So, all right. So, Conduct a hypothesis test. When does that go up? Okay, uh, and then construct a confidence interval. All right, 
P1 is the population proportion. That would be only what God knows because there's no hat on it. Yeah, and then that's the sample size. What is X1? X1 is the number of successes in that, or if you want to call it a success, it's the number of midgets. All right, so same thing happens with your proportion on the second column. That's P2, sample size. That's the number of successes on your second sample. That's your P hat, Q hat. That's from your man-made side, okay? Now, here's what it called, what you have to calculate. This is the, when it's a pooled proportion. Pooled proportion means P bar. That's not exactly average, right? This is the number of midgets in the first sample and the number of midgets in the second sample plus the total sample, the total, to add up both so total sample size of one and two. Are we okay? Now, um, so these are the requirements that we need in order to use the pooled variance. So we have a sample proportion. So when you're doing a problem on the test or whatever your project for the midterm, the sample proportions are too simply random. They're just selected. The way they're selected, like when you turn the lights off and pick somebody out randomly, is a simple sample. Okay, and now we need that the two are independent. The samples are independent uh, uh, if the value is selected from one population not related somehow naturally to the second. Yeah, or the populations are not related somehow naturally paired or matched. Uh, sample values for each population. So for each of the two samples, what there has to be at least five successes. This is when we're going to use the normal distribution instead of binomial. Where NP or NQ is greater than five. Okay. All right. So here we're testing a null of P1 and P2. Or P1 and P2, is that from our, is that from our man-made side or is that from the God side? Do you see a hat here? No, what does that mean? God or man? Huh? Nope. When you have a parameter, mu, sigma, and you have rho, right? All of those parameters are from the population. When you get x bar, s, p hat, p bar, uh, or you get, uh, you know, s, or you get p hat, all of those are man-made. Anything with a hat or bar or anything that looks weird is based off the man-made side. Anything that's a pure mu, whether it's a mu of the difference between the thing or is a mu average or sigma. Remember, hold on a second, get some water. I wonder if my swallowing will come out. Anyhow, so this is this is the hypothesis. This is what it's all about. I'm telling you, if this is the null, what is your alternative? Well, it could be that P1 doesn't equal P2, and that would be a two-tail. Here, we're using Z, which means we're assuming it's what? What distribution? When I say Z, what distribution am I thinking it is? Z, come on. I mean, how many distributions do we have? It's a normal distribution. Z is talking about normal. In order to use the normal, we had to have this true. Independence, right? And they're, you know, these values not related to each other. Now, when you're doing your thing, well, they're paired up, aren't they? Or matched, at least. So I would think that probably you're going to be using a student T. But anyway. And this is how we calculate our pool sample. What does this assume? It assumes that the variances, the variances are the same or very close. 
in that case, you will have to use this calculation. We put in here. Do you see where it says P bar? This is how you calculate. What is X1? X1 is how many midgets you got on the first sample. X2 is how many midgets on the second. These are the sum of your two sample sizes. Okay? So we have our P hat, like we're supposed to, and minus our P hat 1, minus P hat 2, and then we have this guy, right? What is P1 minus P2? Well, that'd be equal to 0, if it were true, right? Because I could subtract a P2 from here and over here so that P1 minus P2 equals 0. So what is that? I'm actually testing. You're always plugging in your null in here. So I'm testing that this is 0. Okay, and I'm calculating it, and then I'm going to see where it hits on my reject or, or, or accept region of the distribution. Okay, and Q bar is simply 1 minus P bar, just like Q hat is 1 minus P hat. So the pool, so. So once you got that, then it's quite a f chore because you have to take each one of those calculations, multiply by that, and you come up with a test statistic. Any questions? Too easy? Oh. Oh, I don't want to. Okay. So, all right. Now, what other way can we test? We can do the p value. The p value is what? What is the p value? Somebody explain it to me. How do you calculate p value? Not all at once. P value. You cannot get through statistics without knowing what a p value is because that's going to help you either. OK, this is another test. You're either going to do your test statistic, yes, or you can use the p value to determine whether you accept or reject. Right? There are two. There are two ways. And you can use a confidence interval, too. but. That will be for what, what, what special circumstances that will see. Anyway, okay, my point is, and I'm asking you, how do you freaking calculate a p-value? Okay, since you're all going at once, I'll show you. Here we go. Not sure how many times I've done this. All right. Where should I start? Okay. If you have a test statistic, let's call it Z test, all right? It has to land somewhere in here. <laughs> I'm sorry, but the test has to land somewhere, okay? Also, you're going to have something called your level of significance, alpha, which is equal to 1 minus whatever they tell you the confidence interval is, okay? They're going to tell you we want a confidence interval of 95%, 0.95. So 1 minus 0.95 makes the alpha 0 0.05. Do you understand that? Now, depending how my alternative is, look, suppose that, okay, here it is. My null is asking, is the proportion of midgets in the first sample equal to the proportion of midgets in the second? Okay. Now, how do you set up the alternative? Well, it depends how you want to answer that question. You want to think that alternatively, they're probably these people are bigger than the other or something like that, bigger midgets or whatever. In this case, you would do row one. Notice there's no hats in here. It would be greater than row two, let's say. All right? In which case, this is a one tail test to the right. Do you see it? So if I do a one tail test to the right, I put all of my alpha in here. I don't divide it by two because it's not a two-tail test. It's a one-tail test. This tells you the direction to the right. And that is 0 0.05. Now, that is the area under the curve. So when you look at your table, you're going to see the guts, which you're going to look for your 0 0.05 somewhere, and then you're going to go to the margin. And that's going to tell you what this critical value is. Okay, so that critical value is going to be, that's on a Z. That's a Z number. I'm going from the guts to the outside. So let's say that that represents 1.96. Okay? All right. Now, now I got my test statistic, and it has to hit somewhere. So I look at it, and I say my test statistic it hits here, the Z test. This is my Z critical value. This is the Z test. 
you got to know this. You can't do any hypothesis testing, really, without knowing what your p-value is. The p-value is simply the area from the test statistic on back. Okay? Put it in your own words. How would you say it? You plot your test statistic, and you see what your area is to the right. What is the level of significance? It's whatever 1 minus the confidence interval is, the amount of area under that curve. You look it up and you come out to the edges and margins that gives you the z-critical value, okay? So I can look. Look what's happening. If I see, if I see that my p-value, that's that guy, all, everything, the area under the curve in red. I'm not comparing this number with this number so much. I'm looking at the area of this one, right? As it compares, I'm looking at the area of this one. See that area? And I'm comparing it to this area. Where this was the alpha point zero 0.05. This is the alpha era area. You see it? I think you can see that this area is bigger than that area. Well, so if your p-value is bigger than your alpha, you are in the accepting or not rejecting the null hypothesis. If it's the other way around and your test statistic hits over here, yes, you will see that your level of significance area is bigger than your test statistic area from there on back. That way you can look at your results, you can just look straight to the p-value and compare it to that and, and you can tell me. And you'll have that problem in the final. They're going to give you some summary statistics and they're going to give you a p-value. The p-value is the area from the test statistic over. And it's going to give you a critical value. Or you know by the problem itself what the level of significance is. Bang, done, OK? If they give you the p-value, that means they already calculated the test statistic and they put it right in there for you and they told you the area over. They may not even give you the test statistic. They're just giving you the area. The p-value is the area under the curve. The alpha divided by 2, or the alpha all in a one-tail test, is the area under the curve. So I'm simply comparing which area terms of the other to decide whether I, I reject or do it fail to reject the null hypothesis. Beautiful. OK, now, so I'm just telling you, that is p-value. You need the p-value under your skin. You need to think p-value, boom, like that. It's the test statistic score area to the right. The alpha is this score to the right. Now, if it's a two-tail, you know, you have, to, you have to just divide that by two. Okay? Is there any question on p-values? P-values is the same. And it's going to be the same. This is for two. This is for two samples. Right? But it's the same thing for one sample. The p-value compared to the level of significance. Okay. We haven't gone over it. But it's going to be the exact same thing when we're doing a confidence interval. Look at what happens when we have the confidence interval with one sample. OK, when I do one sample, well, that's pretty easy. I've only got one sample. I only have p hat 1, right? Minus an error term, right? And then I'm going to bottle up God's truth, row 1, because this is one population, one sample. And this is going to be less than, well, again, our p hat that we calculate from our sample population plus an error term. Okay? That's how you make a confidence interval. Now, this e guy depends on the al if, if it's alpha divided by 2 or not. Remember, in this case, I came up with a z value here of 1.96. That 1.96 is the z value. It is the number corresponding to the area under the curve of alpha, or alpha divided by 2 if it's divided by 2. OK? So that's that number. It'll change according to what significance level there is, whether it's going to be 2 or less than 1.96 or more. depends on what, how tight you want your level of significance. And guess what? p hat q hat divided by n, p hat q hat divided by 2, these are this, what it would be anyway. I mean, 
it, I mean, we were used to taking the, the probability of success times the probability of failure divided by n is a kind of a deviation for a binomial. Okay, any questions there? That's too easy? Okay. You get to forever hold your... Okay, now. <laughs> Does this expand any? Yeah. Okay. So. Okay, equivalent method. One is using your test statistic. See where the dang thing hits. Right? So you're going to simply take, uh, I'm going to tell you that I have, I have confidence in her. For example, I tell you, I tell you that I'm telling you in the problem that I want, <laughs> I want a confidence interval. I'm telling you a confidence interval, confidence interval. I'm telling you I want to be 95 per, or 95%, meaning that I want an interval, whereas if I keep running that experiment over and over and over, I expect that 95% of the time it's going to fall within that range. Okay? So what I'm saying is that the alpha, the, this is called the level of significance. Okay? That would be equal to 1 minus CI which is 1 minus 0.95, which is alpha is 0 0.05. Now, if I'm doing a two test, I'll have to divide that. So I'm going to have, if I assume it's a normal distribution, and I'm going to do a two-tailed test, then I'll go here and here, and I'll put 0 0.025 and 0 0.025. Okay? As soon as you get that, your job is to find out these Z critical values. And this is the first way of testing it. And all we're going to do is calculate a test statistic and see if that test, that test, and let's say that test statistic hits here, which is the way you're supposed to say we fail to reject. Fail to reject, this is how you say it, the null hypothesis. You don't really say we accept the null. You are, but we don't say it because it's n we're not saying anything's exact here. It's with a certain probability, okay? So we reject means actually that you're accepting. You accept that in, a, in, a, in essence. You're just saying we couldn't fit with uh, the, the evidence doesn't reject it. Okay, so and over here, when we land here and here, if the test statistics here or there, well, then we say the null hypothesis is rejected. And the alternative, what seems to have the support of the evidence. Do you see how clean it is if you really you know, want to test some things using science, right? Because everything about science, unlike, say, a religion, is it, it has to be, you can't even ask the question in science if it's not falsifiable. You understand what that means? It's not falsifiable, right? I can't say, okay, look, God is true because the Bible says it's true. So you're using the Bible to prove itself. You know, why is it true? Because it says it's true. That's a tautology, a circular thinking. Okay? That we can't even bring into science. Because there has to be falsifiable. So if I make the claim that all polar bears are white, and I find one that's black, <laughs> in science, that's it. You just falsified it. It's not true. Right? But if you have some kind of thing like, it's, it's impossible to prove. I mean, it, okay, it's impossible to disprove. So anytime in the, does anybody know what the word rhetoric means? Have you ever heard rhetoric? There used to be courses taught in rhetoric. In some, in some, cor in some colleges, some liberal arts colleges, they still teach rhetoric. It's the art of persuasion, almost like sales. How do I close the deal? How do I talk to you? How do I close... How do I make my point? All right, whatever tricks you can use to do that's rhetoric. Okay, so you know, the, the, I'm going back a step here, right? This is when you're using a test statistic to accept or reject. This is not the p-value. 
Okay, now it's talking about looking at it again, but now let's look at it in terms of p-values. Okay, and we pretty much went through that. But uh, look at what the null always is. The null will always have an equality sign. Always. Okay, and then uh, we had. Okay, so this is a hypothesis test. Uh, if you want to test a claim about two proportions and using the p-value method, which we pretty much show because this test statistic, right, if it hits right here, guess what? From here over is all the area. It's a lot bigger than that area. So it's certainly in the failure to reject. Are we okay with that? No, let's go down. So then I go down here. The p-value method, look, uh, let's just, okay, 91 problems include two samples proportions. This was with lights and plates. This is people were driving with, I think, with one plate. Okay, look, it tells you the significance. What is another word, what, what symbol do we use for significance level? Oops. This <laughs> significance level. What's the symbol for it? Alpha. Yes, alpha is the significance level. There, I tell you what it is. Now, you have to look at your alternative. The alternative is going to tell you whether it's going to be a one tail. Let's say, for one to the right. That's going to be one tail to the right, and you'll put all of the point. Uh, whatever the point zero zero five in that tail. Uh, oh, all right. Or it could be saying that the alternative could be reading that uh, row one is not equal to row two. In that case, you're going to have to take the significance level alpha and divide it by two and put it into each end. Okay. And notice that it the calculation is going to give you the p value. So now I just have to compare it to one of these alpha divided by twos. Okay, let's see, yeah. Oh, I, yeah. Okay, this is the one I was telling you about the cars. Um, let's see if we can do this. Okay, so, uh, the, so what we want to test is claim that Connecticut and New York have the same proportion of drivers that are driving around with just one rear plate. Many of the states, you have to have two plates, one in front and one in the back, including California. I got pulled over one time. I was um, dancing in Santa Cruz, salsa, and I was coming back, and uh, I got pulled over. So they wanted to say that I was drunk, and I said, no, I'm not. <laughs> Let's do a test. So uh, anyway, OK. so. So if P1 equals P2 is false, then P1 doesn't equal 2. That's pretty clear. Uh, so anything that doesn't, tr does not have equal can never be in the null. It has to be in the alternative. Okay. So here I say that the proportion of the two states of drivers that are going without a license plate in the front is the same in both states. And it says it isn't. Yes? And it's telling you that we have a level of significance point source, so we use alpha. There it is, 0 0.05. Okay, now uh, let's go down. Uh, I don't think I can do that. Uh, okay. Okay. So um, we got to set up now. The step that follows. This is our pooled variance because we have two different. These are the number of people that are without plates in one state and another in another state. <laughs> 239 in this state without, without a front plate and nine on that one. And these are the sample sizes, right? That's P bar, so guess what Q bar is? One minus that. Okay. Okay, so this is a two-tail test. All right, all of this stuff. Now, this is what? What is this Z? What have I calculated here? Now that I got P bar, Q bar, look, 
man-made, that difference minus what we hypothesize the difference is, yes? If it were one sample, we just cover everything with P2 in it. And this would be P, P hat, Q hat. Okay, well anyway, we got 7.11. And what is Z? What is this number? What is it? What, why did we do this calculation? And what is Z? What do we do with that Z? What is it? Well, I mean, if you graph it, yeah, but what is it? What is Z? What are we looking for? What, what do we do with that 7.11? How does that fit into our hypothesis testing? It fits in because this is a Z test. This is what we use to see if you're hitting here or here. Every time we go through this, and if you're going to use a test statistic, you're going to have to calculate the test statistic to see where it actually hits. All right, all of this, including this down here, this is where the devi deviation goes, right? In this case, because w the sigmas are close to each other or equal, we had to do the pooled. Right? You got to know. I'm doing the same thing over and over. Either I'm looking at a p-value and comparing it to the alpha, or I'm going to count a test statistic and see where it falls relative to the critical values. Okay, let's go back and see if I can actually do one. Uh, let me see this, because I think, I think it's over here. Yes. Let me go back down. Huh. Yeah, let's see. Yeah. So, if you hit it right there, oh, that didn't help. All right. Okay. Well, I guess we'll finish off. Is it? We're pretty close. It's time. Yeah. It's time. Students are always seem to be anxious to leave. I don't know why. It's so fascinating. Oh, I know. I need to go like here. Oh, no, here. <laughs>